Here we are again to talk about aviation matters. Another two weeks has gone by and uh, we've got the Skype hookup working. Paul Brennan here in Wellington and Martin, you're still in Melbourne? I'm still in Melbourne, yes indeed. Still doing God's work. Absolutely. <laughs> well, plenty of news to uh, talk about, no shortage of subjects. Let's start with the big stuff, the A380. And from the day that Airbus launched this program, what was that, 2000? Quite a few years ago now. There was yeah. criticism from people saying, well, the very large aircraft market is sort of dying. Uh, airlines won't buy this plane. It's too much airplane. On the other side, you had people saying, well, obviously in the big airports around the world with the slot constraints, at some point uh, that will catch up and uh, big airlines with... Uh, high frequencies, but uh, no more room for growth in frequency, would naturally go to this aircraft. And Tim Clark, Emirates Airlines, biggest operator of the A380, is saying, look, if when they're finished with these things, there's no aftermarket for them, they'll just park them. They've done their business. He only gives them 15 years. Yes. In fact, he gives them 12 to 15 years. He says the whole business case around that aircraft was based upon a 12 to 15 year return on investment. And yes, uh, once the time is up, he'll just put them in the desert, have them cut up and scrapped, which of course is just flies in the face of conventional wisdom, which as a plane has a commercial value of 25 to 30 years, is completely the opposite of what the legacy airlines in America think, uh, particularly Delta and anybody in any of those airlines which are still running the old um, MD-80s net. And he says, yeah, um, they've made their money and they'll go. People have been going on for years about, oh, what are Emirates going to do when these planes come up? Nobody likes them. They're going to have zero resale value. And, yeah, Tim Clark's just nipped that in the bud. He says, I don't care if they've got no resale value. I'm not even thinking about the resale value. They're gone. They're history. Because he says they have to work within the business model, otherwise they don't work. Yes, and that's why he's so keen to order more of the more efficient model, the Neo version of the A380, because that'll make him even more money over a potentially shorter period of time. You know, the Neo, he might scrap after eight to 10 years. Yeah. At some point, that might change the way um, manufacturers build aircraft. They might say, well, we're not gonna build them for 30,000 cycles and 30 years. We're gonna build them for 10,000 cycles and 10 years, and the price will come down. Exactly, you don't need to build that longevity of structure. Uh, the thing mm. is though, we've been saying it a few times on our program, that uh, we're seeing it a lot, aren't we? We're seeing 747-400s with only half their hours on being sent to the desert, no hope of flying again, uh, only half way through their design life. So Tim Clark's basically said what everyone else is doing. Exactly. Efficiency and improvement has overtaken the traditional life cycle of the the first, second, and, well, I don't know how many generations we are into the jet age now, but you know what I'm saying. So that's that's yeah. interesting. And that sets down a challenge too, doesn't it, to his competition that uh, only think about competing with us on a business model of actually flying people around, not what your plane's worth later or how much you can get back from the resale, like, you know, we used to think about our cars. Yeah, and if you think about it, our cars have you know, kind of gone the same way, you, you, you know, a lot of people turn their cars over every four or five years, and a 10-year, 12-year-old car is now considered an old car. And they don't expect to get much back. There used to be a day, though, I remember, where people would, you know, clean up their car and cover all the paint anomalies and uh, polish it yep. up and do the tires and and uh, uh, water blast the engine bay like you'd do up a kitchen in a house to improve the resale. <laughs> yeah. Quaint. Yeah. No, nobody cares. No one cares anymore. They just throw it away. Yeah. Unless you drive a Volvo 240, Paul, which um, my car's coming up for 23 years old and it's going quite well. It Thanks. refuses to die, that machine. Well, I refuse to let it die. Yeah. Yes, you, um, TLC, I think is the phrase. Uh, yeah, not that much, but yeah, some. Speaking of Emirates, uh, just an aside, Tim Clark's also been quoted as saying in the last week or so that we need to know the real story behind the disappearance of MH370. He mentioned that he thought that the aircraft was in control all the way to its impact point, though he didn't specify whether that was human or autopilot control. His airline operates the biggest number of 777s in the world, so I guess he's got a vested interest in wanting to know what happened. He sort of intimated too that it wasn't where they thought it would be. Did you catch up with those comments? Yes, I did. He seems to think the Malaysian government is hiding something, doesn't he? 
Well, that's the sort of reading between the lines feeling you get, yeah. Yeah, he, he's convinced Malaysia knows more about what happened than they're letting on. Yeah. The question is, why would they keep that to themselves? Are they ashamed of failing, essentially, on that evening to track the aircraft, to get to the bottom of what happened in the immediate aftermath, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Or is he, you know, alluding to something more sinister? Well, he, there's, there's two things. Uh, I mean, yeah, the, the one thing he definitely alluded to was he seemed to think there was a very high value cargo on board and that it was a botched hijacking to get at that cargo, that that was quite sort of relatively plainly said. Because he says, why isn't Malaysia telling us what was on the plane? And right. apparently they won't say what was on the plane. Even when asked, they will not say what was on the plane. Are there any sort of rumours pointing to what might have been I, I on haven't, the plane? I haven't gone further than that. I just thought that was very interesting. So he's suspicious, isn't he? He hasn't sort of fleshed it out any more than the points we've just touched on but you just read between the lines that that guy is unsettled though he's not at any moment and I guess he never would saying uh, that you know the aircraft he feels is unsafe no he's not saying that but he but at the same time he is saying as a huge operator he really would like to know what happened and fair enough yeah absolutely what do we know about the Malaysians you've done a bit of work there I I haven't been to Malaysia before but uh, I understand that um, you know that loss of face thing is quite prevalent there and that um, people tend to try and cover up embarrassing things is that the way they work particularly the government does like to give the impression that it's always in control and it is a bit of a controlling society so right. but yeah leave yeah. it at that but it's no surprise that they're not entirely forthcoming right well he'll know he's a savvy guy he deals with lots of people around the world with his airline he'll have a feel for the culture won't he yes Interesting. Very. The mystery continues. It certainly does. It's a real bugbear how much you pay in this country to fly between regional airports or two regional airports and between them. And uh, Martin, that criticism's not going away. People are grumpy. Well, they are. They have every right to be grumpy because $445 from Taupo to Nelson is quite a lot of money considering I've just crossed the Tasman or actually a little bit less than that, eventually, in, in my primes. But Air New Zealand always defend themselves by saying, well, you know, flying region is very expensive and someone's got to do it, yet we shouldn't do it for a loss and this or that and blah, blah, blah. But I guarantee you that if a competitor opened up or started up, pretty soon thereafter, Air New Zealand would introduce predatory pricing, drive them out of business. They would protect the market. Now... If they didn't want the business, as they say they do, they say it's actually too expensive to fly regional and it's not a it's not, you know, a main profit center for us, our main profit center is international. Well, if it was a business they didn't want to be in, they'd actually encourage competition and back out of the market. Well they'd back out. But they never do. They never ever do. No. And there's a reason for that. (laughs) It's got to be and the reason certainly isn't because they like losing money and helping your average Kiwi. There's obviously money in it, otherwise they wouldn't do it. When you have a monopoly service and the rest of your business is exposed to increasing levels of competition, then it's always going to be the monopoly business that will underpin, if it's successful, the cash flow, the primary cash flow of the operation. And I think that's what the regional services do for Air New Zealand. They can always count on that cash flow. Absolutely. And and also internationally, Air New Zealand... Their stated aim is not to compete internationally with anybody. So you, 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 if you look, they always try and have routes that only they support. Yes. So North America to New Zealand. And vertically integrated all, all the way through, you know. Um, yeah. But so I don't, buy that. I don't buy that they say, oh, we'd actually rather not be in the business because it costs us a lot of money. Well, then let someone else compete. And, and but the, the competition always say, well, there's no point. Well, the, the, the potential competition always say, well, there's no point in us starting up because the moment we do, Air New Zealand kills us. Exactly, and it's been a long time since there's been any uh, competition. I, I'm just trying mm. to figure out how it cost that airline. Uh, what was the amount that you mentioned, 400 and some? Well, it's got nothing to do with what it costs them. Yeah. It's what they can take. Yeah. Well, exactly, but when they present this uh, argument of theirs to the public, they are always saying that it's not cheap to provide these services and they're sort of bordering on uneconomic. I'm trying to work out how $450 can be justified for, what, one of 19 seats in a C-1900 through to Wellington, presumably through there, and then a Dash 8 back to its home base hub where it has to go at least once or twice or three times a week. 
with uh, another 50 passengers on board, and it costs that much. Yeah, you just can't buy the argument that they're doing it out of the goodness of their heart. It, it is making money, otherwise they wouldn't be protecting it. Yeah. And the yeah. only reason it's making money is because, uh, as with many things in New Zealand, it's, it's a monopoly. Hmm. And they can count on it. A, <laughs> well, a lot of airlines absolutely. would be rubbing their hands in glee if they had a monopoly nationwide regional air service available to them that no one else competed against. I mean, you know, it's so obvious. It is. It might just take the government to come in, but that won't happen. Well, it wouldn't be the government. It would be the Commerce Commission. Well, where are they? I guess you have to make a case to them before they will investigate. Though you'd think they'd yeah. pick up on these matters just as a matter of course. It's obvious. Um, the head of Air New Zealand is saying that the airline spent close to $200 million refurbishing our existing ATRs and ordering nine new ones. Well, that's, okay. that's a pretty good deal, isn't it? Well, it is considering they're, you know, it's costing them every day they fly them. That's really nice of them, actually. Yeah, 66, 70 seats. Yeah. Uh, what, seven, eight times a day? Yeah. Well, let's say at a minimum of 100 bucks a time. That's 7K yeah. an hour, let's say, times eight. It has the ability to yield quite a bit of cash flow any given day. Not the ability. It yeah, is. It is. Yeah. So you've got yeah, one. And the, and the last three seats on that plane or the last couple of seats will be sold for 300, 350 plus. Wow. There you go. All just cream on the cake, huh? Absolutely. Oh, well, it'll be a long, drawn-out battle. <laughs> oh, if there is a battle, there'll just be the odd complaint in the newspaper and that'll be it. I don't think anyone's going to put up the money uh, in this day and age anytime soon to create a competing service. Well, why would they? Because they know the business will be taken off them the moment they start. Well, for a start, it's going to cost a lot to set up. Who's going to, yeah. who's going to throw the money in? And exactly. Mm. All right, the Airbus A320neo is flying, looking good. We've mentioned that. Yep, the and A350 Airbus is flying, looking even better. Certified. Certified. How was that uh, formation they did? Five of them. Yeah, pretty cool, eh? On the certification day. That's how to celebrate. Well, uh, Boeing is uh, producing the first bits now for the MAX. So it's all on. As of October 13th, first uh, parts, which were fuselage stringers, began to be manufactured at the Boeing Fabrication Integrated Aerostructures plant in Auburn, Washington. There you go. Yeah. Um, it's a big moment for them, except those stringers are exactly the same as the stringers that were built for the 737-100 50 years ago, <laughs> That's I suppose. right, yeah. <laughs> Not much change there. Not much change there at all. And, 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 and because no need to change. No, it's yeah, the good design. And the first flight's in three years, so I don't know where they're going to store those stringers. What do they do? Make up a sort of head of steam of parts that enables oh, the know. production line to spark into life. Do they? I have no idea. I suspect, I mean, I'm a little bit cynical when it comes to corporates. Um, I suspect this announcement has been made because the A320's just flown. Right. So you've got to look like you're doing something. You, you've got to look like you're doing something because they just announced that the new CFM Leap engine's flying and now they've announced that they're building stringers. I think they're just trying to keep you know awareness yeah. up that they're also building a new generation narrow yeah. body even though the stringers are unchanged potentially in five decades yeah <laughs> and and probably a lot of other bits too yeah like 90 percent of the planes probably unchanged actually <laughs> now the launch customer is southwest airlines yeah i've noticed uh, quite a few shots coming out now of the scimitar winglet 73s yeah hmm. basically what douglas put on the um dc10 it was it? no it was the dc10 originally they um put that on in 82 on a continental i got a picture of it continental dc 10 10 and i think nasa actually funded it and then it just sort of went away until the md11 came along what seven or eight years later looks quite fussy doesn't it it doesn't look particularly elegant yeah it looks like if you if you bang the wingtip you'd be in for a bit of grief <laughs> yeah changing the whole thing because they're about a million bucks each or something aren't they they're expensive yeah. bits yeah they are well, I guess you've got to put a fair bit of structure in there to keep them stable and not floppy. Yeah, and that's all about stopping that effect of the uh, the twisting air off the end of the wingtips, isn't it? To break yeah, up that keep vortex. Yeah, the vortex under control. And uh, to lower the drag that that causes. Hmm. 
But, uh, yeah, it's funny. It's like uh, taking an old car that was released in the late 60s and sort of keeping the core of it, but changing, well, not even changing the, the actual shape of it, really. While the stringers might be the same design, lighter. maybe uh, you know, maybe they're a little bit lighter. They might have changed their alloys. Yeah. But, I, you know, probably haven't. Martin, it's always fascinated me reading crash reports and listening to stuff about uh, air accidents, how it's never one thing that causes the crash and there's, you know, a whole cascading series of events that can lead to the ultimate disaster. And um, I was reading about a Thomas Cook 757-200 uh, recently uh, doing a flight into Newcastle in the UK where... Uh, it was a wet night and the captain sort of bungled the initial part of the approach but got it back online about four miles out and then got told to go around because the aircraft in front, which had just landed on the windy, wet runway at night, reported a possible bird strike. And from that moment on, you could tell that the commanding officer who was flying the plane got flustered. He left the full power on for too long. The uh, aircraft oversped the flaps limits by quite a lot. He got... Um, warnings of asymmetric flaps after that and uh, that got their attention and distracted them from other communications and then on landing um, discovered they had virtually no fuel left. And it's just uh, another example of, uh, and that's where you hope when you're sitting down the back, that the people up the front, when they're faced with anything outside of the normal, can cope with pushing back against those degrading events. Yes, it is always interesting how something unexpected comes up they enter into the remedial or well, the catch-up tasks incorrectly and it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse from there on. And at no point do any of them say, hang on, we're stuffing this up. Yeah. Let's stop and think about it. And it turns out after all that, after every possible bungle short of flying it into the ground, it landed normally at the diversion airport albeit with very little fuel left. The plane was perfectly capable of recovering from, you know, they oversped the flaps, they had slat flap disagreements, they had all sorts of nonsense going on. But at the end of the day, there was nothing wrong with the plane. No. And if they'd just taken the time to sort themselves out, the plane would have handled it for them perfectly. It said here, just before the aborted landing, the captain applied maximum thrust and disconnected the auto throttle. This is mm. the go around. But, but they forgot to disconnect the flight con uh, the autopilot, the, the, which, the autopilot. which tracked the localizer, and so it's, it's the aircraft wants yeah. to fly in the completely the opposite direction. It just everything went wrong. Then he disconnected the autopilot, but forgot to disconnect the flight director, so that was giving them, and it just went on and on and on from there. Yeah, in fact, they were sort of lucky. There was a certain amount of danger there towards the end, especially oh, with the low danger. fuel. They yeah. were they were overspeeding. They were diverging from altitude. They weren't in control of the plane, and yet, despite all that. There was nothing wrong with the plane. Yes, they overflew their assigned altitude by 400 feet because they hadn't set the Q and H. Well, yeah, at one stage, at, yeah, at one stage they were overflying the altitude. On the downward leg, they were 500 feet below the assigned yes. altitude. Yes. So it's just it's just complete botch up. And I mean, I'm not judging. It, you know, obviously, you know, they'd flown back from Spain. The weather was bad. They probably, you know, it's it's a charter airline, so they probably spent all day on the plane. Yeah. And they just weren't prepared. They thought oh, I would have a quite nice a nice quiet landing go home to you know after a hard sleep. day's work yeah no problem but it yeah and, and wasn't it, and to it, be it, it pretty much nearly went all to hell and they ended up a good deal away from their original airport as well i think they diverted to manchester with in, no fuel and probably in quite a lot of trouble well you'd have to do some explaining wouldn't you a reasonable amount i'd expect yeah every time i read something about this or hear something like this I always think back to that American Airlines 757 accident over Columbia. Yeah, when they hit the they mountain. They wrestled the autopilot into the... and it did a barrel roll. And then, of course, there's Air France, what, 447 or whatever it was. Oh, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's... I mean, that yeah, aircraft was really completely flyable all the way. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. No, I mean, it had a, and a and sensor and problem, and but there, were, there was a whole procedure for flying it completely safely, even without that information, you know? Apparently, part of the problem there, it was they brought in the senior pilot and he basically panicked and then it really went downhill. Right, because the leadership goes. Yeah. In fact, some of the transcript I see has just been released from the flight cockpit recorder and uh, I think one of the last words was, we're dead. Yeah. Oh dear, we're dead or something. Um, encouraging words from the captain. Yeah, not good, is it? No. All right. Again, nothing wrong with the plane. That's what they get paid the big money for. Yeah.
And another incident of the past week or so. Did you see, Martin, that picture of the KLM 747 on the grass at Amsterdam? It looked like it had taken I a did. really sharp turn into the turf. Yeah, and dug landing. itself in. Yeah, really dug itself in. Mm. But they're saying um, a malfunction after disconnecting the autopilot after an auto land as they're rolling out. Okay. Yeah. So what, do the yeah. brake, brakes jam on or the nose wheel suddenly turn? Um, I Two, three hundred tons of plane takes a bit of dragging out of the mud. Yeah, does that overly stress the undercarriage? It must be uh, pretty hard on it. Yeah, I don't think it stresses as much as a juicy crosswind landing at uh, you know, yeah. full landing weight. Well, I remember watching the JetBlue A320 land with the 90-degree nose wheel at LAX, and it just ground down the wheel to virtually nothing. And I believe that aircraft was back in service in no time. It didn't have any yeah. major, major damage. Quite a dramatic picture. Boy, the tires go deep into the grass, don't they? They do, yeah. That's a well, lot of, a lot lot of, of friction. It's a yeah. lot of weight. A lot of weight. Be alarming, though. Um, you'd wonder how this was all going to end up if you're up there in the cockpit. Once you feel the plane list to one side, I think you're pretty sure how it's going to end. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there was a nice uh, little piece on 60 Minutes lately. You may have seen it uh, where they flew one of the Qantas 76s out to the desert from Sydney to Victorville. I don't know if they went via LAX. Um, for customs, but eventually ended up uh, Victorville. You've been there. Nice piece. You can search yep. it through YouTube. And I've heard great feedback from non-aviation people about it, Martin. They were intrigued. By I'm the surprised whole thing. those ropey old 76s made it all the way. OGG was the aircraft they um, showed, and I remember I've seen that aircraft at Wellington quite a few times. I got it on videotape, I think. 25 years, 5.2 million passengers through it, they said. Oh, yeah? It's quite a few, isn't it? Is, that's, that is a lot of people. All right, let's get to our aircraft of the day. I'm pretty sure you're going to like this one, Martin. It is one of the safest aircraft ever built, Martin. There's a clue. I don't okay. think any of the aircraft of this type that were built crashed ever. I don't think they lost anyone in, uh, well, at least a decade of flying on these things. And we're talking pre-1930 design. Four engines. Four engines. Now you're getting warm. Biplane. Biplane. Box kite tail. Yes. Yep. Enclosed cockpit. Yep. HP 42. You got it. Top speed, 90 knots. Yeah. Civilian yeah. airliner by Handley Page. First flight, November 1930. I've got a model of this plane that I've never built. The model's got two fuselage sections because there was the... HP 42 and then it was the HP 45 that had a slightly, very slightly different fuselage and carried a few more people with a shorter range. And the names, they had names, what are they, were named after Greek mythological heroes. So, That's right. Well, no, 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 not just Greek because you had Heracles, Hengist or Hengist, um, Horsa, then you had um, Horatio, uh, Hanno. Yeah, I always liked Heracles. I thought it was a very cool name yeah. for a plane. But uh, amazing looking plane. And if you could overlook the fact that the wing looks like it was built out of canvas and scaffolding, the actual front of the fuselage looked quite modern. It did. You know, fully enclosed. And it had that ripple um, aluminium skin. Sort of corrugated. Corrugated, yeah. They were intended for the Africa and India services, uh, uh, the information I'm looking at here. The HP-42, based in Cairo. Uh, powered by four Bristol Jupiter 490 horsepower engines. Uh, same wing area as a 767. Because about that time, Boeing were building the, what was it, the 247. Um, Douglas yes. wouldn't have been far off building the DC-2. And Britain are building a box kite tail scaffolding and canvas winged nightmare, yes. actually. That's but right. Beautiful. 24 passengers was the capacity, crew of four. The range was 435 nautical miles. There you go. So it was a slow trip. Climbed it really was a slow trip. Climbed at nearly 800 feet a minute, though. That's not bad. That's back in the day where you just took things easy and you just watched everything just waft by. Really waft by. The coast of Africa. Had a smoking deck. Well, they probably did. Well, they had a smoking section, I would imagine. Yeah, probably, well, probably the crew smoked. Beach, you could have had a balcony. Well, remember that one that uh, there was a French plane that had a little balcony out the front? No, that was the Russian plane. Oh, was it? Ilyets, the uh, Ilya Moromets or something. Okay, yeah. yeah. Would you go out there right, at cruise speed? Kind of a wonder. Yeah, yeah, with 120 mile an hour wind coming <laughs> through your hair. 
they lost a few, but it seems to on the ground weather related incidents like two were blown together and destroyed. One was torn loose uh, from its mooring at Doncaster Airport in a gale. It cartwheeled, ended up inverted on a railway track next to the airport. They couldn't repair that. Well, when I get one, I shall not fly it to Wellington. I think uh, Peter Jackson should have one built. Yes, but he shouldn't fly to Wellington either. It should last about five minutes. An HP 42 appears in the graphic novel Biggles, Deadly Snow, which takes place in 1951. Quite a few of them appeared in movies. Horatius I mean, can be seen in the 1937 film Stolen Holiday with Kay Francis and Claude Rains. And uh, they fly from London to Geneva on an HP 42. Well, I wouldn't say fly, wafted. Wafted, yeah. Or crawled. Yeah, wafted is, is a good word. An unidentified HP-42 is clearly seen in the beginning of the Hayao Miyazaki animated film Kiki's Delivery Service. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I've watched quite a few of Miyazaki's movies, the animated movies, and I must admit I haven't seen that. I'll have to go back and check. The only operational accident was a heavy landing by... Helena or Helena, one of them. Know, yeah. And uh, after a hard landing, it was grounded later that year. Post-accident inspection condemned the airframe due to corrosion and it was scrapped. Oh dear. Except for the front fuselage section, which was used as an office by the Royal Navy for several years. <laughs> well, who would, why wouldn't you, eh? Oh, it feels like just like being in the HP-42, sir. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's because oh, it is. Yeah. That's actually quite nice. Anyway, that's our aircraft of the day. Been looking forward to doing this one for a while. I've always wondered about this aircraft from uh, being a kid. There's two models, the HP-42 and yeah. the HP-45. That was for European services. Yes. They loved doing that, didn't they? So the HP-42 yeah. is for Africa, India, HP-45 for Europe. Yes. Okay, our time has wafted by, Martin, just like the Handley yeah. page, HP-42 and 45 wafted by at 2,000 yeah. feet. 90 knots. 90 knots. Top speed. Actually, top 100. speed 110 knots. Oh, wow. The whole thing's vibrating and shaking itself to pieces at 110. Cloud of oil. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't hold it, uh, Captain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's probably where that came from. Anyway, so that's time for our show. Paul Brennan in Wellington and... Uh, Martin, still in Melbourne. We'll talk again in a couple of weeks. See ya. All right, then. See ya.